before I present that distinctive panel that we're going to have today, I would like to give you some context and try to explain why we are celebrating this day, why it's so important to talk about forests. So first of all, because they cover one third of global land area, which is about 4 billion hectares, more than 60,000 tree species. Also because they are home of about 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity. And most important of that, they provide a large amount of ecosystem services and benefits that affects directly 1.6 billion people that will depend on forests for food, for shelter, energy, and also for other sorts of incomes. So uh, usually we dedicate uh, one day to a specific topic. For instance, for today we have the Father's Day and also the World Sleep Day. And next Monday we'll have the World's Water Day. And then, by the way, uh, go to our website to see website to see the events that we are prepared next week. So it's normal to emphasize why the why it's so special to have a dedicated day to that. And uh, it's also an opportunity to raise and point what is not going so well, what kind of concerns should be addressed. So, so this is the other side of the coin. So despite the importance and the benefits that, other, that the forest could provide us, forests are in danger. And, and according to the World Wide Fund, we are in 2021 in a turning point. So it's close to global disaster. So the alarming rates of deforestation and degradation that despite they are decreasing and also the impact of climate change are contributing to ongoing loss of biodiversity. Since 70s, we are lost 70% of species. And the opposite, in the opposite direction, the human ecological footprint has been increasing more and more beyond the capacity of the planet. So the numbers are quite drastic and dramatic. So every year, we are losing 10 million of hectares of forest, about the size of Iceland. What about 30 football pitches every minute? So what are the consequences of that? So despite we are losing biodiversity, we are also losing habitat for forest dependent species. Around 1 million species are close to extinction. We are damaged ecosystem service, the land is getting degraded. And most important of that are the impacts of these numbers on lives, on livelihoods and culture of millions of peoples, indigenous peoples and local communities that are affecting their future generations. So for you to have an idea, the people that are living in extreme poverty, 90% of them are depending on forests for at least part of their livelihoods. Adding to that, we have the problem of wildfires. So deforestation, degradation, the climate change, all of them are setting up perfect conditions to have intense and more extreme wildfires. And especially in places that they don't have any history on fires. So for northern latitudes, the boreal forest, we are getting a lot of fires with a lot of consequences, consequences in terms of releasing greenhouse gas emissions for the atmosphere. So unfortunately, the overall picture is not so good. So the planet is sort of flashing red lights of system failure in front of our eyes. So we need as a citizen, we need as country, uh, take some initiatives to protect the forest, protect them better, and also restore them faster, which is actually the theme of this International Day of Forest. So this is the message that I would like to send you all. It's like a sort of wake up call. And, but to talk about this and much more, I have the pleasure and honor to present three prominent scientists. Well, at least two of them are joiners. We are waiting for the third one. They have a lot of work and experience dealing with a forest related topic, especially in Portuguese forest. But before I do that, usually to know about a little bit more about you, about our audience, Usually in our event in Portuguese semester, we, we launch a sort of a Slido, which is a, a switch is three simple questions that to make some interaction with you. So I will try to share my screen. So I hope that you can see it. So for those who never use the Slido, you can point, to, you can go to the slido.com and use that code. It's uh, IDF, International Day of Forest, or you can point your camera of your smartphone and scan the QR code. I can start with a poll with the first questions. So from where are you following us? So where are you watching us? Which country, city? So Italy, in Ispra. Usually we have some, someone from the moon. I don't know if today we'll have the same person. Portugal, the moon, so the person is there. <laughs> so we can pass 
to the other question. So how many trees did you already plant in your life? You have five options. So one, two, more than two, none. Or I hope that the people will not answer, I don't like trees. Okay, so many trees, so more than two, which is a good sign. Nobody replied, I don't like trees, which also is good. So we can pass to the third one, which what comes into your mind when you see a tree? What kind of word, what kind of feeling? What do you think about when you see a tree? You can say just one word. So this is a good feedback. Peace, tranquility, light, freshness, calm, O2. Okay, it's a lot of ecosystem service provided by forests. So some, sometimes people, they are not aware of the amount of things that the forest can provide us. So, okay, thank you very much. So I can stop the pool now, just, and I will stop. Share the screen. Okay, so thank you very much for your feedback. So now it's time to, to introduce our distinct panel. So I can, both of them, they are foresters and researchers at the Forest Research Center, School of Agriculture in Lisbon. I will start to, to introduce João Silva. Uh, hi, João, thank you for being here and accept our invitation. João is an assistant professor when he teach mathematical analysis and statistics. His research, and it's more than 20 years, is focused on wildland fires and vegetation monitoring, including remote sensing of fire and vegetation, spatial temporal patterns of burned area, pyrogenic emissions modeling, and long-term trends of forest productivity. So, João, thank you once again for being here to accept our invitation. So, I will pass the floor to you. And thank you very much once again. Okay, good morning, everybody. I would like to start by saying that it is a pleasure to participate in this event of the Portuguese semester and to thank Duarte and also the other Portuguese colleagues that uh, are organizing uh, this event. So I will start sharing my screen. Okay, just one second, it should work. Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay. Is it working? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So in this uh, in this presentation, uh, I will make, of course, it's a, a brief characterization of the, the Portuguese forests. And I will cover some topics uh, like the, the, our main forest species, uh, their special, their special distribution. The, the changes in the area of the forest in the country in, in the last century. And finally, the role uh, of forests on, on uh, mitigation and adaptation to, to climate change. I'm starting with some curiosities about trees and uh, asking what is a tree? Is there a definition for tree? Uh, so in this uh, slide, we have three pictures, we have a palm tree, we have a pine tree, and we also have a, let's see if it's a, a shrub or a small tree. So do you think all, all the three are trees? Uh, depends on the definition for, for um, the proper definition of a, of a tree for a forester, like we are, we don't consider a palm tree, although it's called a palm tree, is not a tree because it's not woody. So, like a formal, a formal definition of a tree, it's a woody plant, uh, at least six meter tall with a single trunk. Uh, so, with this definition, the palm tree uh, is not a woody plant, so would not be a proper tree. 
and also the small uh, tree or shrub on the right because it's it has uh, several trunks is would not be also considered uh, a tree uh, in terms of uh, of forestry also another curiosity what is the oldest tree on earth is it's this uh, species of pinus, uh, Pinus longeva, is um, it, it, with a, an approximate age of 5,000 years. It's impressive. Uh, this pine species occurs in the mountains of, of the United States, in California and, and Nevada. They are very, very old. Uh, also, what is probably you will guess this one? What's the tallest tree on Earth? It's the there are several uh, species of sequoia. The, the tallest is this one, the coast red hood, uh, also in the United States in California. There are several national parks with these species, and uh, some individuals of these species of sequoia of uh, this. Coast redwood, uh, the higher the height is longer. It's it's more than 100 meters. What what is impressive? Now, moving to the Portuguese uh, forests, uh, our main topic. Nowadays, they cover around 40 percent of the area of, of mainland Portugal. But how was the evolution of, of this area in the last century? For those who know Lisbon, this motorway nowadays crosses a, a forest. Uh, it's a park really close to the, the, the city. Uh, it's a very dense forest. Basically, it's dominated by um, umbrella pine and also some eucalypts. But imagine this several decades ago. So it would be something like this. This is a photo of the 50s of the last century. Almost the, the trees were almost absent in, in these hills of, of this, this area. So all the, all the all this area used to be agriculture lands. This process of afforestation, of planting forests, occurred all over the country in many in many public lands and also on common lands sometimes on these common lands against the will of local populations of course uh, for those who remember in these uh, those days portugal was a di dictatorship so it was easier to uh, do the the forestation on on the public and even in the common lands so now i will show you some tables and the plot with the evolution of the forest area in portugal uh, of course, the very old ones are not forest inventory, it's more some estimates. But when, as you see here in the, let me see if I have a pointer. Yeah. Here, at the end, at, at the end of the 20th, at the end of 19th century, uh, the forest cover in Portugal was very low. Uh, it's estimated to be less than 10%, around 7%. Uh, then during one century, basically all the 20th century, the forests really increased the area. You can see here the plot. It was uh, an, a huge increase, basically uh, with the plantations of um, maritime pine and eucalyptus uh, plantations. Uh, these were the two species that increased more the area. This process of a large increase in the area of forest is not only a unique case of Portugal, of course. In other countries, like we have the examples here of, uh, of France, uh, Scotland, Switzerland, also they increased a lot the area. But in Portugal, if you notice, the increase was really high. This process uh, is called by some scholars, the forest transition. So it's uh, in, in, uh, in our countries, uh, in some European countries or where the area of forest increased a lot during the, the last century.
this map shows the actual the present the, the the present time the present day's land cover of Portugal is the last data we have for the land cover also data from the forest inventory uh, in the in the map the green the dark green areas these areas these areas are in where we have this one the the, the region with the number one is basically covered with eucalypt plantations and uh, maritime pine plantations then here in the coast it's very ancient ancient very old uh, pine uh, plantations they were planted for the stabilization of sand dunes in the coast in region three the region tree is dominated by different species, cork oak and umbrella pine. This will be the subject of, of the presentation of my colleague, Alexander, so I will not talk about these species, more typical of the, the south of the country. And also in Algarve, in the south of Portugal, we also have eucalypt plantations and also cork oak forests and cork oak woodlands. So, uh, a large part of the country is covered with eucalypts and maritime pine plantations. Of course, as you can imagine, environmental organizations criticize the use of eucalypts in Portugal. They argue that eucalypt is an alien species uh, with several environmental impacts. On the other hand, it's very important for pulp and paper industry in Portugal, and economically, it's really important. Also the same for maritime pine. Giving the example of maritime pine forests, economically they represent a large proportion of the number of jobs and companies in the forest sector. And also um, in, it's another role is uh, it's the role of the pine forests as a large carbon pool. It's the largest. It's the largest carbon reservoir of of the Portuguese forest. We will talk about this later uh, on the relation of forest with climate change. Of course, talking about the Portuguese forests in Portugal, uh, we cannot talk about Portuguese the the, the forest in Portugal without mentioning the the wildfires. It's a, it is a complex problem that occurs in other countries. It's not unique uh, to Portugal. We have very severe uh, fire season in the last years in Greece, in Australia, in California. So it's not only the, the situation of Portugal. It is, uh, why do I say it's a very complex problem? Because it, it's the consequence of several drivers such as climate change, land cover change, but also social changes. If we look to the, we know already that we saw previously that in the last century, the area of forests really increased in Portugal. Uh, but this, at the same time, we have a large decrease in the last decades in the, in the agriculture. And of course, this is partially explain it by the decrease of the rural population and the increase of urban population. So this is not typical for Portugal, several uh, countries, uh, in particular in the Mediterranean, had these changes. So uh, in, in, the last, in the last decades, what we have is uh, very, in, mostly in the north, in the center of Portugal, very large areas of forest that are not properly managed uh, because we don't have uh, population there or for uh, other reasons because the the, the forest is not uh, as perceived as a, a good that, that should be well well managed just to mention quickly that I would, like to, I would like to stress that not all fire is unwanted. We, sh we cannot call fire wildfire to all fire. So we distinguish the wildfires, the one that we don't want 
and we can think about the fire as a tool or what, what we call the prescribed fire. Prescribed fire is, is a very efficient tool to reduce the amount of surface fuel and, and this will lead in the future to a reduction of severe and large wildfires. Here I give some examples. Uh, on the top uh, is uh, pine forests where uh, we, we can do this in spring or in autumn. Uh, of course, we cannot do it you know, during the, the fire season, but with the proper uh, climate, uh, atmospheric conditions, um, weather conditions, we can apply prescribed fires to make to have a reduction of the surface file. And with this, if we reduce the surface file, the probability of a crown fire that is severe is reduced. In the, on the bottom, I also have another examples of creating some mosaics on the landscape or reducing the full of um, shrublands. On here, on the right, we can use also prescribed fire to create or maintain fuel breaks. Fuel breaks are stripes that try to stop the large fires. Finally, I will talk a little bit about the role of forests on climate change. Uh, our, the way we reply to climate change is based, it's usually classified as mitigation and adaptation. And uh, uh, mitigation means stop uh, releasing CO2 to, uh, to the atmosphere or to remove CO2 from the atmosphere that we can do it with forests. Adaptation is uh, it's, uh, how we can cope with the changes that we already have or we will have in the future. Again, uh, the forest can have um, a role on both mitigation and adaptation. Starting with the mitigation, if we see, this is the last report of the, the country of Portugal in, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we have here the main uh, economic sectors like the agriculture, the, the energy, the, produce, the production of electricity, for example. And then we have the forests. The forests are the only sector that remove, not only they store, they are a long-term pool of CO2, but they remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So forests are basically our only tool to, uh, to, to remove CO2 from uh, the atmosphere. If you, if you see here, only it's only always uh, a sink of CO2, except the years where we have very large fires, the years with severe fire seasons, and we had this, the worst three was this, the, the, the fire season of 2003 and 2005, and the fire season of 2017 were in, in these years, the behavior of the forest is the opposite. Uh, it's, it releases CO2 uh, uh, to the atmosphere. Just an example of the concerning the adaptation, just an example. Uh, I give here the example of the urban forests. On the other hand, of course, uh, they capture CO2, so they have a role on mitigation. But on the other hand, they help urban population to adapt to heat waves, for example. Uh, it's proven that the, the, the urban forests help uh, to reduce the heat island effect of the cities. Usually the cities have a higher temperature than the surroundings. So in the future, uh, uh, heat waves are projected to be more frequent. So if the forests, if the, the cities uh, have more green areas that will help population, urban populations to adapt to cope with the uh, with hives. Just to finish, uh, Lisbon was the winner of the European Green Capital uh, in 2020 it, with many goals, of course, but one of the main goals is to plant uh, 100,000 trees to add to almost 1 million trees that we already have in the, in the city. Okay, thank you very much. Obrigado.
Thank you, Joan, once again, for a very interesting presentation. So uh, we already have some, some questions pop up, so but they probably will kick the, the questions, the most interesting ones, to the, at the end of the presentation after Alexandra. So if you agree, I will present now Alexandra. Yes, stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Joan. So Alexandra is also a researcher from, from the Forest Research Center in the School of Agriculture in Lisbon. He's, she's working for the last 20 years in climate change and carbon accounting in the Mediterranean ecosystems. Now she's currently developing a project on mixed cork oak and stone pine forest, bridging ecology, civiculture, and the production of non-wood forest products like cork and pine nuts. So once again, thank you, Alexandra. I, I pass the floor to you. Okay. okay. Hello. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let me share the screen. One moment. Okay. Well, let me start uh, by uh, first uh, uh, thank uh, Duarte for, for, for inviting the Forest Research Center to participate in this event dedicated to Portugal. Uh, it is a pleasure to be able to show a little bit of our country, uh, our forests, and their products. Um, my presentation is entitled Portuguese Forest, where tradition meets high value products. Uh, this presentation was also a challenge for me. <laughs> uh, so, because what can I say about Portuguese forests that may interest a, a broad audience at the, and at the same time bring uh, the best of, of Portugal uh, at the same time? So, uh, I decided to tell you a little, a little bit about uh, two Mediterranean species. Uh, there are none uh, wood forest products. Uh, that are harvested there, and how uh, this is, uh, can all be closely linked with the, the uh, rural communities and the economy. I will start to, uh, to present these two elements, and um, these two elements make, uh, are, are part of our uh, daily life, and, um, and I would like to ask if you can tell me uh, what are the products uh, from these pictures that come from Portuguese forests? Can you see? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you say pine nuts and cork, you are correct. <laughs> okay, we have the pine nuts that comes from Portuguese forests, not only in Portugal, but uh, a little bit from all the Mediterranean uh, hotspots in the world. And also we have uh, the cork stoppers, uh, uh, made of cork, of course. Um, uh, which trees produce them? Well, the, the pine nuts uh, come from a tree that often appears in, in gardens. Uh, um, and every, everyone recognizes it by its shape. Uh, the canopies uh, uh, of the other trees resemble umbrellas. And this has to do with the maximization of light exposure of the canopy. These species are called light demanding species. Umbrella pine, as you can see in the name, in the common name, uh, we can call it uh, Pinus pinus, the scientific name, stone pine or umbrella pine is the common name. And uh, in fact, uh, it's like this, they resemble umbrellas. So this is why the common name is umbrella pine. Uh, in fact, umbrella pine resembles, uh, 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 has this uh, very interesting shape and it, it usually is not confounded with any other species because they really need space and uh, light exposed canopies to grow. And in the top of these uh, trees where this is where the, the uh, uh, pine cones are uh, produced and developed. So these trees uh, at others only produce cones when they are very sparse. They don't like neighbors uh, competing for a light with them. Uh, and so this, this uh, uh, production of cones in this kind, type of stands only occurs in sparse uh, forests uh, when they are free for, 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 of competition. Uh, the stoppers, per se, perhaps the most uh, emblematic um, products, uh, are made of, of cork. 
which is harvested in a species called Quercus tuber. Okay, the common name is cork. This uh, tree, uh, as you can see here in the landscape, is protected by uh, the Portuguese law, which means that it cannot be harvested without authorization. It has a unique feature because it's the only tree uh, that can live without uh, its coat during the most damaging season of the Mediterranean, which is the summer. Uh, so uh, when the cork is stripped from the tree, first it gets a, a, a very uh, orange color, the trunk gets orange, and a couple of weeks ago, it turns red, just like this, creating a unique landscape that's uh, typical of our montado, montado ecosystem. The montado ecosystem is how we call it uh, the, the, the mixture of poor coke and uh, sometimes also with the Quercus ilex uh, uh, species, also a uh, Quercinia from the Portuguese forest. But since we are, um, okay, so cork is uh, uh, formed by the, the tuberin, the, the, uh, how this is, this is a, a chemical element that uh, provides uh, several layers of um, uh, tissues that every year form these, uh, these uh, tuberin layers uh, and uh, therefore producing the quark. Uh, so where are these forests from Portugal? Uh, and since we are in an international audience, I will first uh, uh, show you where is Portugal, which is this small rectangular <laughs> Uh, here in the in the most uh, west, uh, southwest part of, of, of Europe, it is known for having uh, Portugal is known for having revolutionized the sea navigation, helped to, to to delineate the world map during the, the the era of Portuguese discoveries. It is also known for for um, the amazing real sardines, <laughs> which is a, a traditional fish recipe and the absolutely amazing uh, beaches in, in Algarve. But Portugal is in fact a, a country of strong ecological contrast, divided by the Tagus River, okay? I take this chance to, to, to show you where are we, the, the Institute Superior of Agronomy and the Forest Research Center, it's right here in Lisbon, the capital. And the, 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 the Tagus River is right there, Okay, so I invite you all to visit us. So the Tagus River divides the, two, the Portugal into uh, the north, the north of the country, with uh, small landowners, mountains and hills, more precipitation, and uh, with conifers and broadleaf species adapted to moisture conditions. And then we have the south of the country. Uh, characterized by adapted species to dryness and very poor nutrient soil. And this creates profound changes in the landscape, as we can see here in these two pictures. Okay, the, the two species uh, that I mentioned, uh, cork oak and stone pine or umbrella pine, are mainly in the south of the country. Okay. And they the both species occupies more than 900,000 hectares in Portugal, which represents about 30% of the forested area. Okay, they are both Mediterranean woody endemic species, very well adapted to this climate. And they are also uh, extremely uh, have a ha uh, extremely high importance. Uh, economically and socially, and as a conservation value in Portugal. Portugal is also the top exporting country of cork, and one of the most important for pine nuts, either in Portugal, either in the in Europe and outside Europe. So if you, if you know already, or if you had the chance to buy a Mediterranean pine nut, you, you have, Probably you 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 are aware that they are very very expensive. Sometimes in retail, this 
uh, pine nut costs more than a hundred euros per kilo. Sometimes it it call it, it's called the black gold of the Portuguese forest. So why it is so expensive? <clears throat> this has to do basically with the the, the, the nut development, development and processing in the tree. And also it has to do with traditional way of harvesting the, the cones in the trees and market demand. So the cones of the pine nuts are harvested in natural forests and the cones take approximately three years to, to, to develop in the tree. So we have three layers or three cohorts of of uh, cones in the tree. And obviously, uh, since the uh, cones are, so, are in the tree, the tree for so long, they are very susceptible to the abiotic and biotic factors and stresses that affect the, the cone production. So we have uh, uh, a great amount of cones, for example, that, di that die all already in the first year of cone development. Um, okay, so for example, there is a high chance if we have a very dry spring that a lot of the small uh, uh, fragile cones just uh, simply uh, die from this uh, very uh, stressful and dry spring. The Pinuspinia have also a very lot, uh, low nut yield. What is nut yield? Is a measure of the ratio between the commercial fine, uh, the commercial uh, final seed weight, which is this white seed, okay, and the total weight of the cone, which is this one, okay. And frequently, what we have is for a, a, a cone that weighs 300 grams, we only have 10 grams of commercial seed. So this is a, a hill, a, a, um, a, a um, nut hill of 3%, which is very, very low. And this has obviously costs for the industry processing and, and uh, um, economic income. So cone, uh, climate change, of course, and precipitation reductions, mainly in spring, as we has, have been observing in Portugal, will, uh, it's, it's a trigger, it's a, it's a problem for this species that will influence, uh, that is now influencing uh, cone survival in the final production. Also, uh, we have a problem of new pests and the diseases already endangering uh, cone production. This one is a leptoglossus, is, um, is, a, is one of the, the most damaging now reported in Portugal that considerably uh, reduces the, the yield, the cone yield. But uh, cone uh, harvesting in Portugal is still a man-made, um, it's still man-made, like it has been for the last 100 years. So I'm going to show you now, try, let's see if I can, if I can put you this, a hand, uh, 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 homemade feel. <laughs> Here, so that you so that you can see how it is uh, done uh, in traditional Eden in Portugal. So I'm going to interrupt. I'm going to watch the video. Okay, and then okay. Can you see? No, no. Yes, I, I only the see. picture. Only the picture. Sorry. Okay. And now, oops. Zoom. You, you can see now? No? Yes, yes, yes. You can see you. now? Yes, yes. Sorry, yes. sorry about uh, this. Okay, this is this is a, an operator. Usually this has to be a very expert uh, expert operator. He climbs the tree with a uh, iron ladder, as you can see. He has the steps where he can 
uh, climbs, this usually can get like 10, 20, uh, 10 to 12 meters, this ladder. And then he climbs to the top of the, the tree. The, he installs then, uh, he, he, he finds a, 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 a thick branch, stable, thick branch. And then it uses this uh, pole, you can see, it's, it's made of aluminum, very light. And then he, uh, uh, the, the pole has, um, has um, a hook in the tip. And then he, from the top of the tree, he can uh, kick, provide a kick on the, on, the, on the cone and the cone fell like this, okay? He fell in the, in the, in the ground. And there is usually a person, usually a woman, that collects the, the pine cones from the from the ground, and uh, and then they are going to the the fabric to be processed, to be opened and be processed. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going back to my presentation. Okay, can you see already the presentation now? No? Yes, yes, yes. thank you, yes. Okay, if you have any questions about this, okay. So this is a very, this is a extremely dangerous, this technique. This, but this is done for a hundred years. So people are used to do it. So innovation is, with, is needed uh, with the widespread implementation of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, machinery, which will reduce exploitation costs and the price of the final uh, uh, nut. I'm sorry, I have to get my, my computer battery. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about this. I had to change the, the place of the of the computer at home and then I forgot the battery. <laughs> um, so the cones are collected in natural forests. The nutrient characteristics are among the most, most interesting uh, from compared with other seeds with high vitamin B1, B2, antioxidants, and proteins. They are biological and chemical free. Stone pine forests are very important for ecological purposes and also for social and economic and economical rural development. Remember this the next time you eat pine, Mediterranean pine nuts. So we move now to the to the to the other species, and we I want to ask you if you know what is cork. Do you know what is cork? Okay. <laughs> Cork is the bark of the Quercetuga tree. It is a natural product removed from the tree every nine years without killing the tree, in fact. Most people think that it kills the tree, but it doesn't. So how the cork is formed? The cork, for, the cork is formed by the ameristem, which is called the phylogen, which produces every year several layers of a cork. Uh, made of uh, a, a chemical compound, which is the suberin, suberin and each, uh, each year it uh, um, forms several layers to the outer part of the bark, forming this fork. Okay. So we, we will now see a, a cork sweeping. I don't know if you have ever seen it, but let me try to, to show you. Again, this is a homemade video. So apologize for that. Can you see already? 
Yes. Uh, no, not anymore. No. Like here, you see, you see already. Not yet. No. It was starting to. I was starting to see, but suddenly disappear. Now, can you see it? Yes. 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 Thank you, Shan. yes okay. Thank you, thank you. This is also a uh, um, very expertise operator in the field. What he is trying to see, uh, what, what you can see right now, it's the operator is trying to, to find cracks in the cork, okay? The natural cracks in the cork. So he's going, he's going to use the hammer to, to make a vertical cut on the, on the cork, as you can see, he's using these uh, natural cracks. Uh, he's now doing a, a horizontal um, uh, cut. So we can uh, 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 remove uh, an entire plank. This uh, hole that you see here, he, he, here it's, it's not supposed to be there in a, in a natural tree because this uh, 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 tree was used for an experiment uh, in the research center where we were trying to study the effect of cork stripping during a dry year. The cork, the, the cork stripping on the, the carbon and, and water fluxes. This 88, this number 88, it's the number of the tree. But usually what, uh, what, uh, what the, the operators do in is when they harvest the cork, they usually put the number from zero to, to nine, which is the last uh, number of the year. For example, the cork that is going to be extracted this year, 2021, will have the number one, okay? So that we know already that the next time he's going to be harvested is to, to 20, 2030. Okay. Did you see that he used the, the back of the hammer to remove the cork? This cork can only uh, it's only um, can only be removed in a specific time of the year is when the meristem, the phylogen, is active, and this is usually. Uh, uh, of course, in um, in um, May, from May more or less to September, okay. And it's very interesting because the operator is very uh, the operators uh, uh, um, uh, go to the field and uh, by touching the but by by touching with a hammer in the cork, they know already if the cork is ready to come out or not. If the cork is extracted outside this very important period from May to, to August, it will create wounds uh, in the, first of all, the, the cork will not come out, will not come out. And the second, it's, um, it, it will create wounds in the, in the tree that will be permanent for all the tree life. And this is bad because this is, this uh, we we don't want this damaged cork. You see, he used the the back of the hammer to to take it off. Okay. So this is a very interesting uh, traditional way of doing it. It's uh, also uh, very well paid. Uh, nowadays we have machineries, but it's not widespread. We have machineries mach machines that can. Uh, uh collect the cork okay but uh uh, uh using uh, that uh, machine or instead of the hammer but uh but uh, it's not a widespread um operation you see he's using the back and he's the, the the cork is going to be um it detaches from the from the from the tree Okay, I think it is very nice. He's, he cannot take it from the ground. Now he's, going, he's using a ladder to go upstairs and he's going to finish the work in the top of the tree. Okay, so I'm going to interromper, partilhar. Okay, I'm, go, I'm back in the presentation. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 
So the core can be skipped about 17 times during the three lifespan. Usually it has with, with on an average of uh, 200 years a tree. So 17 times without killing the tree, it's important. So this process is biodegradable, renewable, recyclable, and it has excellent properties like lightness, the cork is impermeable to gases and water, provides acoustic and thermal insulation. It's also a fire retardant. So we had many applications. For example, the cork stoppers with different shapes, sizes, products for wine, champagne, and other drinks. It is also it is used also in, in the design products, in clothing, shoes, uh, uh, in fashion, home deco, also in uh, uh, flooring and facade covering, building materials, and it is uh, also used. And this maybe probably not everybody knows. Uh, the it's using spacecraft. The cork is using spacecraft due, due to its uh, um, installation properties. Okay, and, and now uh, uh, it is used also for NASA and ESA. But the cork stoppers are, not, uh, are the most economical value product, but not all the, the trees provide good cork. For example, you have here an example of the cork extracted in uh, uh, some trees that have many uh, uh, defects. This is a very thin um, uh, cork. Uh, usually, when the cork comes from the from the from the sands or the forest, it's cat categorized and separated in, in different categories. So the thickness and the the number of defects and so on. And this one the thicker with low porosity, this one is the, is the one that is used for, uh, for stoppers. And the stopper uh, is uh, usually uh, uh, cut, sorry. How can I go back here, here? The stopper is, um, is uh, removed like this, transversally to the plank, okay? It's like this, they introduce the, the these planks that are already cut to the to the length of the cork and then it's it's practic like perpendicularly to the to the plank so finally some final remarks uh, cork provides high income to landowners but other goods are also provided like mushrooms cattle and honey in the in the montagu system they provide soil protection and conservation requirements. So soil protection and conservation requirements for the landowners are prioritized. Also, the understory needs to be cleaned periodically, artificially or using grazing animals in order to facilitate the access to the tree for cork treating. So this significantly reduces fire risk. And cork removal is a traditional and ancestral practice respecting tree health and sustainability. So a take home message is that the cork of Montado is a highly humanized system where the production of goods and ecosystem service are perfectly harmonized with human presence. Without it, the Montado would not exist. So I wanna thank uh, the audience. I wanna thank um, Ana Lorenzo that helped me with this presentation and you are all welcome to Portugal. Thank you Shana for your amazing presentation. Thank you both for your interesting and a lot of interaction uh, with videos and so on so very very interesting. So we have already a, a, a lot of questions uh, so I can start with the ladies first. Sorry João. So I can start with uh, Shana. Um, Give me the easy one. Keep okay. me easy questions. <laughs> okay, I can start with a question from Sandra Caldeira. Are there benefits to the tree for removing the cork? Are there benefits to the tree from removing the cork? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, the tree uh, do not suffer with the cork extraction, except, except in very, very dry years, but is a very, uh, but is a, uh, Commonly, the landowner knows that in a, uh, when a, a very dry year or a very dry springs uh, uh, are, are very in, in those years, 
they uh, will not remove the cork. So it's not damaging for the tree, except in those years. But usually the landowner don't want to, to remove the cork during that year. Okay, thank you, Shana. Now I can pass to João. Joe already replied some questions uh, by typing. So I can select uh, from Tiago. Uh, can you develop on forest and carbon sinks? So when a forest burns, the sink burns. So all the CO2 is back in the atmosphere. Is it still worth it to bet on forest as carbon sinks besides the ecosystem benefits, of course, in very arid zones? Okay. Oh, I only saw the first question before. So let me read the second thing. Yeah, the, it's, uh, it makes sense, yeah. Well, the, the question now in Portugal is that probably we have too much forest uh, for the level of management we have. So I think uh, to think about the forest, not not only because uh, in some areas, like Tiago was saying, probably doesn't make sense to have some types of forest because if if uh, they are not adapted, if it's too arid, we should not have forest there. Uh, for each species, for each forest species in Portugal, we have a kind of a map where the areas where we should plant those forests. So well, it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, deciding if we have that strategy or not. And of course, uh, as, you, as we saw, we have so much forest now that we used to have, but uh, most of them or a great part of them is not well managed. So we will uh, always have a problem with the fire if we don't have a, a strategic uh, uh, change uh, on, on, on but still, uh, of course, the, uh, we s recently we have that very, very severe year of 2017 and everything is changing uh, in the last year. So we are reorganizing all the, the firefighting and the prevention. Uh, so let's hope we have uh, results in, in the next year. Okay, thank you, João. Now back to Shana. Uh, João already replied part of the question. So Sandra Caldera uh, was asking how long does a pine tree live? And, and uh, she also questioned about the resina, what this is used for, and if it is a, or, or not a big source of income for those owning the trees. Mm. Uh, well, uh, uh, cork, uh, uh, the stone pine can live up to 150 years. But uh, we must uh, keep, keep in mind that the productive, uh, that, that the maturity, the reproductive maturity is at 50, 50 years old, 56 years old. After that, it starts to fall, the production. Uh, regarding the resin, it's not a common practice uh, in a stone pine, only in a, in a maritime pine. But uh, actually, we don't have, I don't have uh, data on that. I don't have data on if it is uh, a, a high income for the landowner. I don't have any ideas, but we, I can get you information where we have, where we have, uh, where we have that. Actually, we have, um, uh, we, we are collaborating an international project, which is Project in Incredible. Project Incredible. You can search in the internet. It's a, a, a project which is uh, uh, trying to um, dynamo, uh, create the uh, dynamic be between the European countries in uh, promoting non-wood forest products. And the resin is there. It's a topic. It's a main topic. So I recommend you, I can share this, the link with of the project here in, in the chat. Uh, so you can visit because one of the outcomes of the project was the creation of a series of fact sheets, very practical fact sheets, where the common people that don't don't uh, don't are familiar with the scientific scientific community and we reading uh, scientific papers can get precious information regarding these non-wood forest products. So I can leave you 
that it's a, it's a good way to, to find more information about the resin, not only in Portugal, but all over Europe. Okay, thank you, Shana. So back to João from uh, um, Rita Araújo. She's asking, are different types of trees more resistant or faster recovers from wildfires? And also we'll have uh, something to this question is, it's, uh, is it important the way that forest could be managed or not? Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the question is, uh, it's, it's not an option to have the, the country covered again with natural forests, of, of course. The, the native species of Portugal, like the, the cork, they are naturally uh, resistant to fire. The, the cork is also uh, a way of, the, of resisting to fire. Uh, our native trees are, by definition, uh, more uh, resistant to fire. The problem is we have to find a balance between industrial uh, forests. We also need uh, pulp and pulp industry and uh, timber for industry. So we have to find a balance between natural areas and productive areas. The, 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 the function, we, we cannot expect that the all forests of the country has the same function, protective or conservation, or on the other side, all the forests to be industrial plantations. So uh, some areas should be plantations. And of course, it depends. Some, some people don't uh, want eucalypt in, in Portugal because they say it's an alien, but at the same time, it relieves the pressure on, uh, nat on natural vegetation. So uh, it's a matter of, 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 of uh, having the, the organization of the landscape. And if we have that organization, we could have um, natural forests or natural areas that we don't need uh, to, to have inter great interventions. And on the other side, we have forests like eucalypts that are completely artificial. They are cut and planted every 10 years. And don't forget that in Portugal, we already have 20% of area under protected areas uh, like Red Natura, national areas, national parks. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not uh, an answer of yes or not. Okay, thank you, João. So back to you, Alexandra. So from yeah. Sofia Light, why mm -hmm. is Portugal such a key player in terms of cork? The climate is similar to other countries in Europe, but they do not produce or trade the same. Yeah, this is an interesting question. I think it has to do with, um, yes, definitely a combination of climate and soil and soil also. Yes, maybe it is because it's, um, it's the species very well adapted to our, our ecological conditions first. Uh, and uh, we have the oldest, uh, core coats in the world. So probably now we are uh, um, in the in the in the in the most productive phase, declining, but in the productive phase of cork of cork extraction. And um, yes, maybe it's 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 because we we traditionally we invest in planting. The our ancestors were interested in maintaining this kind of forest because they knew the the viability and the economic and social importance of the co of the cork for for the uh, rural rural community community so i believe it's it's that but other countries are also investing in planting new cor uh, new cork oaks in new plantations but actually the, the what what i think is that the um, what I've heard is that the, in, in those countries, the cork is not as good as ours because, so this may be a, a combination of uh, climate and soil, perfect conditions for cork production here in Portugal. I believe that that is part of the question. It will uh, part of the answer. It's not all the, probably it's not uh, uh, all the, the answer, but, but it's part of the answer, yes. I have already here the website I was mentioned about the, the resin, the incredible project. Where should I put this information, uh, Duarte? Uh, Where? Maybe, maybe in the chat and then I can share with the rest of the people. Chat? Okay. Yeah, so you can okay. put in the chat and then I will send to the rest. Okay, okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you, John, for your, uh, uh, Alessandra, for your answer. So maybe following that, a question for you, Alessandra, from, from Luisa Souza. What do you think about, or maybe Juan could, could help on that. What do you think about the resin sector being one of the strategic factor, sectors of the Portuguese recovery plan? Will we have a strategy for Portuguese forest? Mm. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy answer, I guess. It's not an easy answer because yeah. uh, I think that resin uh, is produced already in, a, a, in, a, in, a, um, in other countries, namely in, a, in, a, in, a, in Asian countries. And it, in there, the, 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 the price, the cost of producing it is very low. So it's very competitive. That is why in the past, the, the, the resin... Uh, the, the resin exploitation in, in Portugal decreased because there is a lot there was a lot of competition with the, the, the resin from other countries. So I don't think resin can or is it possible to be a, a basis for the um, Portuguese strategy, but for sure it will help too. It will help, but it will not be as important because there is a lot of competition from other countries. I believe, I believe so. Okay thank, okay, thank you, Shana. Uh, from Rita Araújo to João, uh, when management plans for forest are defined, do they consider all the vegetation in the forest area or only the trees under the formal definition presented? Oh, yeah, I was basically joking on, the, on that on the start of my presentation. Yeah, of course, when you do a, a forest uh, management plan, you consider everything consider all the layers of vegetation from the trees to the shrubs to the grass you consider the the soil protection the water regular regulation so of course we didn't have time to talk about everything but also Duart mentioning the the question of the ecosystem services forest is not of course it's again it's very important to have forest forest plantations to feed all the industry and we have thousands of people living on the forest sector but that's only that's only the the parts that is visible the the wood or the cork but if we have, we have time, we could discuss all the ecosystem forests. That is everything that is more difficult to quantify. Uh, for example, uh, because why do we feel usually most of the people feel, or the, 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 the air uh, services or the water regulations? So when you do a proper well, then uh, management uh, plan for a forest area. Uh, you are frozen, Dwart and uh, Shannon. It's my net that is bad. Yes, it's your net. It's your net. Yeah, we, we have we are having some problems. In your... my net? Yes. 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 So, but yeah, you can continue now. With I think it's better. Yeah, I think it's better. Uh, no, okay. it's not bad. Can you stop the video? Did you get? Yes, maybe you can stop the video, to João, because of the bandwidth. Stop sharing the video, okay. and then you okay. can answer. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Can you listen now? No, it's it's not it's not in good uh, in good shape. So we can we can we can wait for you to get more better conditions. So we can pass to Shana. Mm. Shana, we have uh, an interesting question from, from Ricardo Souza. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, okay, to mark further the Portuguese presidents, we are thinking of sponsoring and planting some cork producing trees in this area in the north of Italy, where, for instance, it snowed this morning. And yes, it was a very, very beautiful landscape. Would such trees resist in this colder, rather than humid uh, climate? Mm, I don't think so. They don't like snow or freezing days. No, no, it's not, it's not a good idea. But it depends because uh, the cork oak uh, uh, likes a uh, tempered, tempered climate, not very cold, not yeah. very, they, 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 yeah, they, yeah. they are um, resistant to, to uh, very hot uh, temperatures during summer, but it's uh, the, the cold in winter is limiting. Yeah, so I don't know, I, I would have to, to, to see uh, exactly what kind of uh, weather and 
So it's very important to take that into account because uh, it's not a, uh, it's difficult to install a core coke uh, plantation. Um, uh, it's it's very difficult. It has to be um, very uh, particular conditions. So, so uh, uh, following that, in Italy, we have only in Sardinia, right? Yes, yes. You have only in the south, the most, uh, the biggest area is in the south in Sardinia. That's why because it's temperate. It's it's not very cold in winter, not very uh, uh, dry uh, or hot in 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 summer. Yes, I I would think about that if it's one or two trees, or but if it is a hundred and or two hundred. I would uh, think twice. Okay, thank you, Shana. Uh, uh, João, I don't know if your conditions are better or not. Let's try. <laughs> yeah, you were you were finished uh, your answer. So if you if you want to continue, I, I don't know. I, I don't know <laughs> where did you what did you word? Well, it was uh, maybe you can reply again because the the conditions were not so good. So. And what was the question again? <laughs> the question was, <laughs> when management plans uh, for forests are defined, do they consider all the vegetation in the oh, forest okay. area yeah. or only the trees under the formal definition presented? Yeah, thank you. Because because I uh, I enter again, I lost the, the questions in the in the chat or the, the Q and A. Okay, yeah, I was saying that. Uh, of course, I was joking with that definition. It was just to start a presentation. Um, we don't care about that formal definition of trees. When we do a management plan for a, uh, a forest area, we consider all types of uh, vegetation, the, the tree layer, the shrub layer, the grass uh, layer, and not only that, uh, the, the vegetation, but we consider the all, all the other aspects. We have to think about soil conservation, uh, for example. We, don't, we didn't have time, but uh, we could uh, stay here discussing all day about the, um, the ecosystem services of the forest. Okay, thank you, João. So um, for the last question that we have here in the Q&A session, we have from Barbara Tinoco, uh, probably it's for João Silva. How was the forest increase affected by the last year fires? Mm, a lot. There is um, basically a study, uh, a paper that shows, or as, as this narrative, so uh, as you saw, the maximum of the, the forest area in Portugal was reached more or less uh, at the end of the 20th century, around the uh, 90s. We had around 40% of forest, uh, only forest, not considering considering the far the woodlands that uh, Alexandra was showing, the agro uh, agroforestry system. So uh, that, that there are more open forests. So consider the the forests. We have huge increase, but then the fire. At the same time, the fire started to be uh, uh, the, the fire incidents incidents starting to be larger and larger on the last. 20, uh, last two or three decades. So if you see the last data, basically the, the fire is compromising the, um, uh, the, the amount of forests. So this is uh, uh, a reason that why we should think about uh, uh, our forests. So I think the strategy, the philosophy is now not to increase the area of forest if the forests we have already uh, needs to be better managed. Okay, thank you, John. So uh, uh, we don't have from the audience any more questions. I have two more uh, questions to you for myself. So uh, it's just more a curiosity to, to Shana. So uh, I remember to, to read, read something about uh, the relationship uh, in between the pollution on the refinery of Singe and the decline of the cork oak. Do you have any evidence on that? Do you have any, any well, study on? That is a Sorry. study from the 80s. That is a study from the 80s. The, the first uh, uh, cases of severe uh, um, cork oak dieback and mortality was there in Finch. And they were trying to find it, it to, to, to investigate if it was re related with the, with, um, 
with the, the industry complex and the pollution. But it, uh, it, that study um, uh, was not uh, as clear as, or it didn't show any evidence that the pollution was the cause of it. Because uh, after that, uh, uh, the country was monitored and uh, there were um, also big areas where uh, the same problem was evident. Cork oaks, uh, dieback, uh, mortality, a syndrome of uh, syndrome of of, um, of dieback, and still that that it's it's, it's now present and it continues until today. Uh, so this this was yes a study from the eighties and uh, it's not related. Okay, okay, it was just a curiosity. Thank you, Shana. So the last question for João uh, um, about mitigation. Of course, climate change amplifies the problem when you talk about mitigation. And recent studies say that, uh, for instance, tropical forests in some point, they can turn into net positive emitter of greenhouse gases. So if we do believe that forests, for instance, can be our allies, and in some point we become a sort of enemy, uh, what can you think about that? Is it a thing that uh, we have to to be scared, it's a thing that we have to expect in the future that uh, the pollution derived from wildfires and and uh, uh, to have a different perspective to look at the, at the forest? No idea. Well, uh, <laughs> again, what what I think is definitely, uh, of course, this is a question for several levels. So we should we should have a kind of uh, international policy on forests. Because when we when we only look to Portugal, of course, it's very important to maintain our forests. Because as we see in the data in the reports, it's the larger pool of carbon we have. If we destroy our forests, we would be uh, uh, emitting a lot of uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. At the global level, is the same thing. Um, it's uh, as you start this presentation talking about the the tropical deforestation. Yeah, of course, um, that, that's the, the common link. It's the atmosphere. If you have a large deforestation everywhere in, in tropical areas, in, in Mediterranean areas, at the end, uh, it will be emitting a lot of, of, of CO2. Uh, but I, I don't have a, uh, an answer to your question. Okay, that was was more or less clear. Thank you, Joao. So I think we have time for more two that pop up for more two questions. So one from Sergio Freire uh, for Joao uh, or even for Shana if she, she wants to reply. With climate change projections, is forest in Portugal sustainable? How and which forest? <laughs> so you can start, Joao, and then we. If, <laughs> difficult if, one. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's difficult. A difficult yeah. one. <laughs> As a forester, uh, yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah. The um, well, it's uh, uh, lots of things can um, can happen. Of course, one thing that I remember from the um, we started and Shana participated in that, so she can talk about the project. Is, yeah, we had a project, and recently we have more projects on that. For example, some things that can happen is the migration of species. These species can migrate on latitudes. Uh, but of course, other species probably we should uh, uh, think uh, uh, again uh, their distributions if they are adequate or not. Yeah, the the the, the projections for uh, for southern Europe are quite severe. For most of the Spain and the south of Portugal, yeah, we will have uh, a decrease on the precipitation and increase on the severe uh, hot days. Yeah, so, and of course, so we have a national strategy for climate change, we have a national strategy for forests, but uh, the, the question is, uh, is first, is that strategy the best? I don't know. And uh, the second question is, is that strategy will be implemented, let's see, uh, in the forest services, the last decades, basically, the, the forest uh, service disappeared. Uh, I don't know. Again, it's kind of a difficult question. Yes. Uh, yes maybe, I, maybe I can complement a bit. It's yes, we have. I've been working in the, uh, like 15 years ago in a big project in Portugal. It was the CM project that made some uh, climate change projections? Projections, and we we also managed to to um, to study a bit about what what would. Uh, 
the forest be uh, in the future under those uh, climate change scenarios? And we also uh, 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 parameterize some, some models and so on. But the basic idea is that we can expect natural migrations of the, the, the trees and the species, woody or shrub or shrub, shrub species that are now in the most airy regions of the south of the country, even in, even in Africa, in the, in, the, in the north of Africa, that probably migrate to the Mediterranean countries, okay? Uh, I give you an example, Figo de India, o Figo, Figo de India is one of the species that will, try, will migrate or will artificially be, uh, will be, some other species will be uh, probably artificially in, uh, 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 introduced in the country and will, they will have, they will find uh, proper conditions or adequate conditions to develop in the country. Definitely a di uh, redistribution of the most productive areas. For example, the cork oak probably will, will migrate to the north parts of the country where it is now already, for example, in Castel Branco or in, uh, in the region of uh, Covilhã. Um, uh, a very interesting study uh, also that I found a couple of uh, weeks ago, it's one that is uh, uh, addressing the, um, the, the Spanish uh, very adapted to arid conditions uh, will probably uh, disseminate in the Iberian Peninsula, namely the Pinos Elpenses and the um, Quercus rotundifolia, because they are very, uh, very well adapted to airy conditions. So, yeah, but we don't know actually which species will develop and, and, um, and uh, face and survive uh, this uh, climate change scenario. Okay, I think it was clear. So, I will stop the questions here. I will like. To, to thank you again, uh, Shana and João, to be here to accept our invitation it was very, very interesting. I was very honored and pleased to, to see your presentation to discuss with you at this uh, final discussion. So, uh, for yeah, thank so you for <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. For your so for the for the rest of the audience, so we'll keep in touch. So check our our website. The, the next week will be we'll have the the World Water Day with a lot of events. So. Keep tuned and thank you very much for all.